So today we're fortunate to have with us uh, Love to Delta and Amakanwa. And this panel is, uh, is devoted to the idea of collective creation, collaboration and resistance as it pertains to artistic practices in India. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to just jump straight into a, a series of questions I'm going to pose to both Amma and Navjur. So perhaps I'll start with you, Amma. Uh, the work, your work, Sovereign Forest, I understand it's an ongoing project and concerns very much the struggles of local communities in Odisha. Could you say a bit more about, about your work and your project and what the motivations were. Um, it's kind of hard to uh, be precise about trying to describe it for a number of reasons. One is that uh, it's a long, it's, 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 it's a work that one has been you know, doing for so many years that it sometimes becomes difficult, it has many dimensions and so on. And more in particular after uh, Ian's, uh, you know, keynote address, it becomes even tougher because there are a whole bunch of things that, you know, keep coming to one's head. So I find it hard to describe. But just since precisely, if I were to try, I would say that uh, on the face of it, in a way, it's a work, uh, the Sovereign Forest is about looking at uh, land, looking at ecology, looking at land rights, ecological rights, um, looking at uh, crime, looking at issues of justice uh, around farming communities as well as indigenous communities in the context, uh, in a context that we are quite familiar with of a very severe kind of assault, uh, a corporate assault. Uh, I mean, a corporate interest in the sense of natural resources and marketing is a very old process. But I think in the last 10, 15 years, we have seen a kind of uh, speed and severity that we hadn't kind of experienced before. Uh, and there has been, uh, there always was, but there has also been uh, a wide range of reactions to this assault. Uh, in many different ways. So mm, the Sovereign Forest is about both these things. It's about the assault, the meaning of the assault, as well as the resistance and the reactions to it. And this would be probably one formal description okay. of it. Uh, however, at, at another level, I would just very briefly say that for me, it actually is about uh, understanding loss. Understanding loss. It's about the inability to understand loss. And it's not about somebody else's, it's not, it's not only about somebody else's inability, <clears throat> but it's, it's a general state of, of inability to understand loss. And I think uh, in this context, in the context of what we heard this morning and in uh, where, uh, you know, one is speaking simply and straight, then that's how I would actually describe it as the, I mean, the beginning of, of, of the work itself is about uh, a non-comprehension mm -hmm. uh, of, of, of loss and even not knowing how to articulate it. So that's what, that's how I would describe it. In a way, it's a kind of uh, a search or a searching. <coughs> yeah, I mean, in the sense that if, if I do not know what, what I'm, what I've lost or what I'm losing, if I'm, if I'm not totally clear about what it is in fact, then I won't even know how to react to it. So even before I can move to trying to understand how to respond, I need to figure out how to understand my own loss. And therefore subsequently is the search for what methodologies or what tools or what ways could I kind of enhance. Mm -hmm. Uh, or increase the probability of being able to comprehend this loss. Now you may want to look at this loss in the context of land mm -hmm. and you could do it in one particular way. You could calculate you know, uh, land and market and value and compensate and so on. And in another way, uh, you know, what, what is the meaning of losing a piece of land has m many multiple dimensions. It, 
you know, personal dimensions, emotional dimensions, practical dimensions, and so on. So uh, that's essentially. So it's you could say, yeah, maybe a search, mm -hmm. but also like a sharing of that search. Yes, that idea of sharing is very interesting, and also the idea. I understand that in creating the work over several years, you actually had to engage with a variety of different actors, a variety of, I mean, from farmers, religious uh, institutions, and so forth. Uh, and I wanted to pick up on that since uh, this notion of working or acting collectively within an embedded situation of struggle is, uh, is something that the schizoanalytic framework takes very seriously. Uh, and I wonder if you could say something more about this collaboration and this process and why it, uh, it has been important. See, as far as say, this specific work that you're referring to, uh, there are uh, several people that I've collaborated with, some, some uh, more prominently uh, uh, and or more consistently as well, you know, with, with, uh, and, and several others maybe for shorter periods of time at different levels. So I'm not sure exactly how to answer you in terms of whether to, to discuss the uh, you know the, the, the nature of specific collaborations with different kind, whether individuals or groups or communities or organizations, or whether to, whether to respond in a more kind of uh, conceptual way. But I mean, if, if I were to just off the cuff respond so that maybe we can get this conversation going and yes. then come back, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, you know, we, uh, to make a film, it, it, we, we are beginning with collaboration. I mean, there's just no way that I could proceed without a collaboration uh, with a cinematographer and with an editor to start off with, or even with somebody to research and to think, to think things through. So for me, most of my work, not just The Sovereign Forest, but almost all my work has, I mean, central to it all has been, at least for me, a sense of inadequacy. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not saying this in, 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 in any sense, but just in the sense of being aware of it. And the moment, in a way, that you're aware of this inadequacy, you, you, you have to fulfill it. You have to, you know, fill it up. You have to compensate. You have to add. You have to kind of reduce the sense of inadequacy in some, some way. And that is essential. In the moment you do that, you're collaborating mm -hmm. all the time. So, uh, sometimes people sometimes they become longer collaborations. And, uh, but I think there's just no way to function, at least for me, without collaborating. Is that perhaps related to the, to the idea that the struggle that uh, is being confronted is fundamentally a collective struggle, as opposed to an individual problem? I mean, because you talk about loss, the loss of land. No, no doubt it is a collective struggle. Uh, uh, absolutely no doubt that you are having uh, large sections, you know, entire villages. I mean, you have several villages, for instance, where the entire village is charged with uh, dozens of legal offenses, irrespective of age. So you could have eight-year-olds also charged with a set of uh, offenses as well as 80-year-olds. So um, you have... Uh, you know, I mean, almost 15 years ago, you would have a, a hamlet actually uh, suddenly getting to know that the uh, the hill range on which they are, uh, you know, have been kind of settled uh, has been leased out for 80 years, 90 years. I mean, the process of leasing it out, the process of identifying that area was uh, maybe took 10 years and they were totally unaware. Uh, but in, in suddenly they know that the river that they have been you know, living alongside from point A to point B is again leased out for another eight years to a, a kind of cartel. So uh, when, when you have situations like that, you have large numbers of people collectively oh. impacted. Uh, but if you're, work, I mean, uh, this is a, you know, I mean, it's, it's the, the, this issue is too complicated to speak briefly, sure. I would say simply, because if you're working even with 
uh, organizations or campaigns or communities or collective resistances, and even if you're working over a long period of time, uh, you find that actually, uh, <coughs> even though these are collective processes and collective resistances, there are too many complexities working internally at an individual level, at individual personalities, uh, strengths, capabilities, weaknesses, confusions, uh, egos, and so on. And these are also actually almost as important as the collective struggle. They impact the collective struggle in many ways. So it's it's quite a complex territory. You know, it's it's it would be simplistic to say simply that this is a collective struggle. Therefore, one works collectively. Uh, uh, you know, one works collectively and individually mm -hmm. at the same time. Um, one of the things you just mentioned was that uh, part of the struggle is really the result of what you described as a corporate assault. Uh, and, and here I think uh, it touches on some of the things that Ian mentioned, specifically capitalism. Uh, to what extent do you think uh, what Ian described as kind of a globalized capitalism, to what extent do you think that uh, the communities that you're working in are confronting that problem? And uh, to use the McLuhan idea, uh, would you say that collectively there is a, a kind of a spell under which uh, these communities are operating? Uh, a spell of, well, or a spell uh, by? Uh, uh, well, let's put it in the way of a, a spell that's uh, a, a capitalist uh, 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 spell, if you like, or an ideolo ideology. Uh, Ian, you want to go? I think. Uh, uh, Maybe in say especially you know post uh, uh, as, as a kind of a sense of such a spell um, operating has been quite enhanced uh, at least in in India a sense of this spell uh, in the last six months because we have seen a kind of coming together of. Uh, of you know a religious right and a corporate uh, manufacturing uh, a kind of a open, uh, image manufacturing machine uh, in quite an incredible near perfect way uh, and so we have actually seen the spell uh, being constructed and it working and and, and, mm -hmm. and seen it so carefully and so closely that it has actually made us suddenly aware even more acutely of many of the things that Ian was talking about in, in terms of a lot of this spell, at least I think that the spell in the last say uh, one or two years is, is quite strongly based on um, the behavioral patterns of specific uh, population segments. Uh, what are they eating? What are they liking? Where are they going? What are their shop? What are their choices? And it's it's actually very very carefully calibrated on this data, <laughs> which has been inputted into political campaigns, into political parties, into conceiving even of the you know phrases of messages and so on. So yes, uh, there definitely is a spell, but uh, and maybe increasingly so. But we are all pretty familiar in 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 a, in a kind of a larger sense of of the marketing of uh, of hope, you know. Yes. And um, uh, and so we, but because it's one such a kind of diverse country, uh, and two because also the uh, you know the severity of this assault is so ghastly that uh, it's not that easy for this spell to persist all the time. So in many areas, I mean, for instance, you would wonder that if, if we speak about, say, Gujarat, for instance, and say that there, there, there was a spell uh, that was constructed. Uh, the spell uh, did sell uh, uh, and continues to be sold. There are always newer and newer people who are buying into that spell. But if you were to look at, uh, you know, your top ten, most polluted sites in the world, 
if you just take that list, uh, you know, Gujarat falls into it. If you look at the Golden Corridor, the Industrial Corridor between, you know, Baroda and Wapi, and so it's it's unbelievably ghastly. Uh, you know, you can take out water; it's black. People have chemicals getting into there. There are like mountains of chemicals. Uh, so, uh, and they, and it still brings me back to the question that you know he had said that you know we care. Uh, uh, you know, we we know. And even when we know, we do not care. So, I mean, for me, my question really is is not really the spell, but about why. You know, I mean, if, if one has the information, then you know, why does that not really? You know, how, how why can't we proceed beyond that? But um, I, coming back to the spell, I would simply say that the people in Wapi, I don't think in that golden corridor they are under any spell. So. Uh, this is quite a, I mean, it's, it's an, as far as we are concerned, it's a new phenomenon, you know, at the spell working at such a high level. Right. But it's also a matter of life and death in many, many ways, because if you're losing your land, it's, it's you know, the spell doesn't work. That's what I was interested in, because I was interested in whether there were uh, perhaps exceptions to the, uh, to the framework that, that Ian presented this morning. And it seems that you were suggesting that perhaps there are. No, there definitely are because you will find quite clearly. You can go to many parts of the country, and you if you will find uh, if there are people who are spellbound, uh, there are also many people who are, are comparing. They're they're analyzing. They're comparing the previous spell and the previous spell and the new spell and seeing what 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 changed what has happened uh, you know they are trying they they are uh, critically comparing critically analyzing so in, in that sense it's not that it's being bought as well uh, i know for instance if i'm you know even if you're working in orissa i mean one of the reasons that kind of attracted me many years back was um, the fact that uh, they were, uh, for, you know, again, I liked one of the things you said, which was that, you know, we're not interested in your problems and we're not interested in your solutions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and uh, the you know, 90, 97, 1998, when I first went there, this was the first thing that was, that I heard from indigenous groups, from just right. ordinary people, that we, we're not even, we don't even want to discuss the problem. We're not, we're not coming on the table as well. We don't want to come on the table so to, to, uh, to discuss it. Uh, in fact, if, we, if we're willing to come onto the table, then we'd like to come onto the table to a problem that you created in, 1950, in 1950. Let's discuss the 1952 problem. And just now we're not discussing today's issue. Uh, and. Uh, in, in that sense, uh, you know, there is also a very strong critical understanding of what is happening as well. Within the community? I think so, yeah. Constantly. Whether it is to do with land and ecology and, and land rights and so on, or whether it's to do with the sexuality and violence. At, at, at yeah. pretty much every level, there is, a, a, you know, a kind of rethinking happening even as there are people who are buying it, buying into the spell, there are as many people seeing through it as well, is my feeling. Right. Uh, Deleuze had this great thing to say, I think it goes along the lines of if, you, if you're trapped in the, dream, in the dream of the other, you're fucked. And what you describe seems to be a, a, a suggest that refusal to enter into the framing of the problem is uh, vital to a kind of resistance. Would, would that be accurate? It, um, I think so, yes. I think it, 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 it is actually an extremely radical position to take. Yeah. Uh, when you say that I'm, I'm not entering into this, this debate. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, I'm not even going to negotiate. And, and it, it's not, it, it tends to get looked at as an impractical position. Uh, or as a loser's yes. position, or, but actually it's an extremely radical position. And um, it, it, it's just that if you're able to sustain that position, uh, socially, politically, in terms of mobilization and so on, if you, which is very, actually that's the real struggle. You're unable to sustain that position. 
uh, just uh, physically in terms of being able to exist and survive. Your survival gets threatened if you take that position by violence. Yeah. You, are, you are basically beaten out physically yeah. from that position. You are not intellectually argued out, you are not politically no. argued out. Uh, but either you're physically beaten out or you're outnumbered in a sense. Uh, but if you're able to sustain that position, then uh, uh, it actually is, you know, uh, that's when you, will, you find people collect around you. you know? that, that position collects people and, and more strength. But uh, I would say that uh, at, as far as that is concerned, um, it is a pretty grim situation. Uh, you know, as far as say, the subcontinent or India yeah. is concerned. It's not that people are not aware, but it's just that uh, they're also aware, they have also been through, you know, I mean, it's true that we have a new government, but <laughs> actually there's a, there's a process of repression that is quite, uh, you know, has, has been going on for quite some time. And uh, it's just get, it's, it's, it's tougher now, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, it is grim, I would say. Yeah, and sure perhaps I can turn to you, the, uh, because you've, you've also worked in, a, in an adjacent area in Basta, and also for quite an extended period of time, over a decade. Um, would, you, would you agree with, what, with the way that Amma has characterized uh, the, the kind of resistance within these communities, the level of criticality, or uh, to use the phrase you brought up before, meta, meta communication, a reflection on this kind of uh, what, what have you found in the communities that you've worked with? You know, uh, for last, uh, earlier I was working in um, Bastar area, you know, which is uh, actually uh, neither closer to, it's about 100 kilometers away from Dantavada, uh, uh, where the next right, uh, you know, problem is going on mm. and uh, it is uh, quite far from a north central part of Chhattisgarh which is Raigarh and Korba, all this mining belt. So so initially it was, you know, my understanding of these things from far because the communities living here where I'm working, where our center is, actually are not directly affected. They're affected for various other reasons but not of these problems. But for the last two years or so, I've been working um, along with my colleagues in uh, North Central part, where, uh, uh, you know, a number of uh, villages, I mean, I work with the two organizations, Jan Chetna and Sartar, in Porpa and uh, in Raigarh. Here, there are about 20 villages who don't want to give away their land for mm -hmm. mining. And their homes are not uh, 10 feet away from uh, where the mining is now slowly moving towards because it's all the coal belt. And uh, so they are resisting and they're fighting and they are paying the price for it uh, because number of, like he said, that you know, the cases are um, you know, registered against them for not accepting a below poverty line uh, uh, ration card or not accepting um, rice for one kilo, uh, you know, uh, rice that they're giving to the poor people, but they're not poor. They say we are not poor, we have 20 acres, somebody has 6 acres, somebody has 10 acres. So these are the, you know, but they're continuing to protest. You know, so, but it is very, um, very, very uh, um, difficult to, you know, uh, imagine what is going to happen because people, non-Adivasis um, who are supporting them, you know, who don't have actually land, so one can't say that it's their vested interest because they're saving their own land, so they're fighting with. So some of these people have a lot of respect for, they have been shot, they mm -hmm. have been killed, some of the Adivasis have been killed, so it is very difficult to, you know, for them even to protest or, and what is happening is, which is so, un, you know, constitutional, is whatever comes your way, whoever obstructs or protests, get away with. You know, this kind of uh, whole, uh, this kind of politics, you know, is uh, so problematic, you know, that one doesn't know. So it's very difficult to really uh, understand and 
Now, in my case, I stay there for long periods, you know, to engage with communities. But again, like he said, that since I haven't lost those, uh, you know, that kind of land, I'm not in that situation, I'm not one of them. To imagine, uh, it is very difficult, you know, keep what it. But still, at uh, both physical and psychological level, I feel that loss can be sensed every minute that one is there. You can see from the film also the, you know, when the, the huge panoramic, you know, looking image of um, mining area is actually 15 villages, two rivers, one dam. So imagine how many people there. And then I was at, uh, you know, Orissa, Chhattisgarh border where this uh, Hirakun Dam's reservoir is there. You know, it's massive, it's huge. But that water is for industry, not for the people. They can't even put the smallest pump to, you know, get water. So then people are now the, resisting. The, the premise for that dam was irrigation. Yes, yes. Yeah. Nehru, you yeah. know, very so first Hirakun dam. In a sense, yes. when, when I was yeah. saying that in terms of comparing yeah. the, the first spell and the second spell and the third spell. Mm -hmm. So the first spell was that this particular for dam people. that you're referring to. Okay. Was for so you displaced, you took over land, you displaced, you yeah. evicted very large numbers of people, for, and and now you're doing those a second very round. people cannot use that water. It's diverted to now it is supporting the industry for coal washeries and all that. So right. in such a situation, when you go there and then you know that uh, village people, uh, because I'm an artist, so they put up that play called you know Lal Pani. I don't know, you know, I had goose pimples. I mean, it's very difficult to imagine. And then, you know, and, uh, but yet I think one engages with them, listen to them. That's why, you know, I'm always very concerned about how to develop that, you know, um, how to create that, uh, you know, sense of listening, mm -hmm. visioning, you know, what they must be visioning, and then also corruption you know, which divert or damage the society's ability or capacity to, or capabilities to imagine for future. Everybody imagines for future. You know, like uh, this morning we're talking about the ads and all that. Every day we see new telephone, I mean, sorry, the mobile or whatever, you know. So everybody is looking at, you know, even if it's an ad for a cycle or a motorcycle or a car, you're thinking of think big, think big. You know, then you see this, you know, where they had big things, the people have land which they have cultivated for years and years and years and because the relationship with land also is very different, you know, then. So I think it is, uh, uh, people are, but I'm very, um, uh, the situation is very grim, but you get a kind of, uh, uh, I won't say hope, but you get a little inspired by looking at people in their own environment, protesting despite all the problems. Yeah. Despite quite, uh, what would seem in, insurmountable in, mm -hmm. in many ways. Uh, you mentioned that the relationship to the land is very different. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if you could say a bit more, because I'm aware that uh, the conceptual frameworks underpinning the understanding of how one relates to the land is, is very different. Uh, from, say, a, a more a capitalist understanding of land. Could you, could you say more about what you've learned? From See, um, I mean, in last 15, 20 years, one thing I've understood is that, you know, uh, uh, you know, when even as children, we used to hear that land is like uh, mother planet, mm -hmm. you know, and they still believe in it, and they still believe in their relationship with cosmic cycle. You know, and all their rituals and festivals have some connection with that, and even their performances, you know, have that sense of uh, where they pay. They still, I mean, through performances which are so conceptual, so which is you, they're not talking about which you because I don't understand the language. It's in Gondi. Uh, I feel that he, you know, and they are paying tribute to the the main deity Lingopen, who is actually who signifies the entire earth. But uh, more than that, I would say that what I've understood in so many years, or I can say maybe partially, that they feel that uh, the natural world offers insight into ourselves, you know, which we have forgotten. That what is that insight into ourselves, you know? 
and now that if I and then that is interconnectedness and interdependence in nature. Now when I read, let's say, you know, I'm also an urban product, I've been to art schools and I've read books and all that, so when I read, um, you know, um, an anthropologist like uh, Gregory Betson's idea of patterns which connect, he's also talking about interconnectedness and interdependence. Then I look back here, you know, when they, in their, through their songs, they're talking about interconnectedness, interdependence, and they, and you know, how they, through their performances, uh, which actually is to pay tribute to their land yeah, or to the earth, they, uh, you know, are able to um, create those sensorial, uh, you know, um, uh, experiences which goes beyond, uh, you know, human terrain. Because this uh, performance called Kokerenge, which means cock-like walk, you know, a cock is a bird. Mm -hmm. You know, so so they they you know the way they do it, it's so uh, it's not like you know they, they actually become like birds. They are not, but you know they they are remembering, you know, a bird also in there. So I those kind of things inspire me a lot, and I think that's the that's where their faith, you know, in that natural world, uh, you know, um, uh, offer that, uh, that you know. Uh, yeah. No. I understand that the, well actually. And also one more thing, you know then they, they let now the way n natural resources are being appropriated for, uh, yes. you know, to generate profit, uh, yeah. you know, for uh, um, very short term sites. Uh, they see land as uh, not uh, something which they, uh, to be sold or bought, but they see the generation, they say, you know, no, something like, you know, 20 acres of land can, uh, uh, you know, they can feed generations after generations. They don't see that if I get 50 lakhs from this or one crore from this, they say that my, my, our next generations are not going to be sort of benefited from that. They see that a very short-sighted you know, um, yeah, yeah, sort of policy, yeah, yeah. yeah, way to deal with land as property. So in a way that, that suggests a, 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 a different alternative to, to the one that we are confronting. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, as, as Alma mentioned, the, the problem is how you can sustain this position in a way, uh, given all the complexities and dangers uh, that, that these communities are surrounded by. Um, like Amara, uh, I understand also that a lot of, well, much of your work is based on collaboration. I was very interested to find out more about how this uh, idea of art as a collaborative rather than an individual pursuit how does that figure within the Adivasi communities? Do they have a, a conception of art or artistic creation that differs, for example, from, from the one that we've inherited, which is one that's very much based on a very individual kind of pursuit? Um, see, uh, you know, they don't look at art as segregated from their uh, social, mm -hmm. psychic, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, system. So art is an activity which is sort of, you know, part of their lives. You know, but to say that ki people always work collectively or together, collaboratively, you know, to produce anything is not uh, a right notion. Because within that, they, a lot of people, you know, make art uh, independently, but what was happening earlier and still happening sometimes, the consumption of their art is used to be within their own communities. You know, so, but since the government now, uh, say, after the independence, they started recognizing their contribution, you know, under this whole thing of craft, you know, and then people were given, uh, uh, sort of rewarded as master craftsmen or something like that. So then, you know, people started understanding the value of that particular person creating even for, even if the consumption was within the community or within the local market or say adjoining villages. Also the exchange of money was very different than how it is in the contemporary uh, art scene. So now say an artist like Jaydev Bagil, 
whose father was facilitated, uh, you know, for his uh, contribution to that, uh, you know, he was a very good artist. So, you know, Jayadri from very young age understood this, that it is important for him to exchange with the urban this. So he started bringing his, bringing his art to the uh, city spaces, uh, galleries or other, you know, places from very young age. And now he's internationally known where his works are in museums and galleries and all. And that pattern followed. A lot of younger people and other artists also followed that pattern. So, uh, so people are making art uh, individually also, but their all other activities are quite collective. Even when they're making their homes, they don't have work. They, you know, especially if it's mud structures. When it is uh, cement and brick and all that, then they hire masons and all that. But if it is uh, in the interiors, if you go, people make their own homes. They are the you know architects of their own uh, the structures that they're making. You know, so there, uh, so there, uh, there is a kind of you know collective, uh, uh, you know, uh, they, which they call sahyog. You know, where the neighbors will help you to, um, you know, in your, uh, you know, the time that you need them, and you will help them. And then the payment is not in form of money, but you feed the village or you feed them or something like that. So there you can. So, but as far as art is concerned. I think artists are in. Um, it's 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 a wrong notion that they're always. Uh, sometimes you know to meet uh, commission works that they take up to support themselves, uh, the people work in groups. Yeah, um, somewhere I think Deleuze and Guattari actually come out and say that to them the uh, the notion of art is, is purely a nominal one. It's um, you know, it seems to relate to what what you're describing. Um, I'm just wondering if, if there are any questions from 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 any of you. If anyone would like to, yes, can can we have a mic? Take off from you know what Ian had said about uh, that even when we know something is bad, we can't seem to change it. And what does that mean in terms of art practice? Uh, with artists like you and you, who are obviously uh, motivated by some kind of uh, activism. Could you tell me what you mean by what do you mean? <laughs> what does it mean? No. Uh, for myself, uh, the, the reason I created what I created, uh, whether in terms of this video granted under peers, I mean, it came out of years of activism, right? Uh, and it was a manifestation. It wasn't like I was going out looking for, right? So the idea was to communicate a dis a distress um, in Kashmir. How do you communicate that distress with a larger public? Uh, even when Shiva and I collaborated uh, with uh, when the gun is raised, when we first started working on it, uh, you remember we said we wanted to take it out to a broader audience to tell them what what is going on in Kashmir. And in the early 90s, hardly anybody knew. Uh, and the idea was that once people know, obviously, you know, there's going to be some remedial measure, but nothing happens. So, within that context, how do you, you, me, Shiva, other people, how do we continue to, you know, why do we make art? Why do we go there? Um, I think. Uh, we bother because, first of all, we want to understand ourselves the situation, you know, uh, one is in and uh, what position you take, you know, like uh, if we talk about capitalism also, you know. So we know that, I mean, whether one is, um, one agrees with that kind of system or one doesn't agree with that kind of system, 
how do you deal with that you know uh, how do you deal with that uh, kind of position that one takes so i think first of all it is for one to understand and then you share it with uh, like minded people and uh, uh, because one belongs to art world so you should begin art world. but uh, you uh, uh, don't imagine that it this must be it's like by engaging you know with uh, the people that you try to um, you know understand to some extent not fully but something that you have uh, one has uh, say supposing in bombay situation that if i myself confront and i'm part of that loss or something then my perception of that loss would be very different than um what i have in i think <laughs> i think you have partly answered my question uh, can can we yeah. uh, you know i mean uh, it's see actually i find almost every position every situation i find actually highly fraught you know at at every level it's like every, every you can uh, kind of this uh, this confusion there's tension there's bitterness there's violence there are ethical issues there are political this you know at at every level uh, one is dealing you know consistently with this kind of a uh, uh, question of how do you proceed not just as an artist but i think just about everybody is you know you find caught up uh they uh, there are also there such a wide range of uh, illustrations of what you could call self destruction generally and that itself is mind boggling you know and repeatedly uh and, and, and clear to see uh, illustrations whether it is massacring people or massacring rivers or or, or uh, you know doing what he was saying with you know technology and information so so you know how do you how do you respond to this whole thing i mean that's so uh, how do you keep going i mean at, so i how would i respond to your question i would say that you know almost with every work over the last 10 15 years uh every work is an is an is an is another attempt to deal with the inadequacy of the previous work in being able to respond to this question so at the end of the previous work that you that i would make i would come up with a set of critical conclusions about the meaning of my work and based on those critical conclusions i would come up with a set of hypotheses or propositions to kind of push it further and come up with a second work which again has serious lacunae and and i think that is that is the way so i mean it, as far as this that's why i said it it was for me it is about loss and about comprehending loss because that's exactly what i would say to you know uh, that uh, <coughs> surely i mean if 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 uh, uh, i mean like if a crime continues to occur and and then you know is there no evidence for it uh, or uh, you know there is evidence but we don't see it or we don't see the crime or we don't have the evidence but it seems that there is enough evidence for the crime the crime is also visible the evidence is also visible then is it a question of our own, our inability to actually see it see both of them so you know in this kind of conundrum what do you need to do uh, what language what vocabulary what synchronicity what multiplicity what methodology would at least temporarily put you in a position uh, anybody myself or you temporarily i'm not even saying permanently but temporarily put you into position to be able to see uh, the meaning of this loss and if that is possible even temporarily then you can you take a you move everybody moves a step forward in some senses and and i think that is the only way to respond was, at least for me i was also going to uh, respond more or less or try but i think it's exactly what um, you just said but in other words i was thinking about the the macro political um activation and the micro political and so the macro is concerned with 
the visible things and, and how you get to an objective. So you go there, you show the world what's happening there, and you expect a reaction. And maybe what you're doing, the way you are doing, uh, it's, it's, it's going, it's creating some cracks under, and this will take other times, which is the micro political uh, thing. I think art can um, go deeper in this kind of um, construction and reconstruction of sub subjectivation and of desire. I don't know if I'm being clear, but um, what he just said, for me it's exactly like it's a temporary state of um, making uh, your work will, uh, if, for instance, if, if, if you work, if he goes there again and again and uh, work with this inability to deal with loss, um, it's a way of elaborating something that um, um, anyone in contact with the work will, yeah, I don't know. I feel it's, uh, it's touching in other places that we cannot see immediately, like the media, for instance, if you're a journalist, you show it, go, it's, it's, it works in other levels, but it's uh, as important or, as, uh, or even more than um, the macro-political levels. I don't know, I mean, just to add, I mean, it's, it's especially in the context of the question that you asked in terms of collaboration, then in the context of the inability to work, in a sense, or the meaninglessness of working, in, 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 you know, in, in that. Uh, I'd actually say, and, and in the context of resistance and politics and, and communities, I think uh, I could suggest, maybe say that uh, perhaps there is, a, you know, some meaning in this meaninglessness that we are in. Uh, of um, in this context of of making and sharing uh, failure work that fails as well, and it's actually in the consistency of you know repeated failures in in, in a way. It's, so it's not it's not that you're being evaluated for the failure, or you're, it's not that you're being engaged. It's not uh, people around you are not engaging with your failure. People around you uh, begin possibly to engage with your repeated failures. And, I, and I'm not saying failure in a bad way. I'm just saying that you know, your second failure is a bit better than your first failure, perhaps, or, or maybe not, and so on. So it's, it's, the, it's the attempt to comprehend. It's the attempt to respond. It's the attempt to doubt. It's the attempt to break through uh, repeatedly and consistently. That actually is the basis for collaboration. You know, it's not, I cannot go to somebody and say, okay, let's collaborate, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. and we start collaborating. It's that, that does not make any sense. You can't enforce it. It does not. Yeah. I, cannot, I cannot hang out in an area for 10 years and say, okay, now I'm fine, let's collaborate. No, I can't do that either. <laughs> I, I have to be, you know, yeah. we have, I, I will be critically evaluated. Everything, intention, purpose, reason, and the, every, everything. What, when I'm, you know, when, when, they, when they, it's peace time, how are you in peace time, how are you in war time, how are you in crisis, how are you not, everything is evaluated. And it's on the basis of that that you possibly may have some kind of collaborations at some level. And they evolve, you know, it's not that you go to collaborate. Can I ask a question? Um, uh, I'm really wondering if it is really possible to collaborate, and we have been dwelling on the idea of collaboration even in the talk earlier, but given the, or the keynote where he was mentioning that we are within a system where do we really have a choice, so I'm coming back to the notion of choice, whether we have that choice when we use the word collaboration, are we really collaborating? And the, the the way I would put it in is that I've often heard this word in, in let's say, the filmmaking industry. It is claimed that it, a film is a collaboration of individuals and the industry, the Bollywood, keeps claiming it repeatedly, but we know it's all about a whole industrialized system where it is all about capital, it's about creating notions of heroes or people who are you know, constantly made into heroes, not only the heroes on the screen, but the ones behind, the directors, the sound people or the song writers or creators, whoever, whoever becomes a hero or a marketable product. So in this sense, is it, and at the end of the day, we stamp it in the name of one person you know, or a few people. So where is this idea of collaboration really coming from and how real is it 
that we think that we are collaborating. I agree, it's fraught. It's full of contradictions. Uh, but there's no confusion. I mean, if you look at it from a Bollywood industry or a Hollywood, I mean, these are mega billion in, uh, dollar industries. So you can be producing films without, you could be directing a film, actually proxy directing it. You know, I mean, it's very easy. There, there are many proxy hits that, are, that, that come out in, in every, every year, you have dozens of proxy hits. And I also am kind of, yeah, you know, uh, bewildered by how, you know, you can have a young, 26 year old making a you know whatever 30 crore film how do, how how can you manage that but obviously there's a system working behind it so uh, true but if you know but if if you were to go into a micro situation um, there are collaborations there are there there are there is a give and take and there is also a continuous uh, uh, issue the who is giving how much, who is taking how much, who is taking credit, who is the author, who is, is a collective authorship, is there money, I mean money or income, all these things are, are, uh, are always up in the air and continuously need to be kind of, you know, critically well. No answer really is correct. And at some level, yes, it is about fairness, it's about equality, it's about sharing and it's about, it's about respect. So it's, how do this, how do these players uh, some so-called collaborators, you know, how do they deal with their own inequalities or their own unfairnesses, if if that that may be so, uh, is is has to be, is just is it's a contentious territory, and it, it, you need to keep on fighting in a sense, or arguing, or finding temporary resolutions. Yeah. I mean, I can go on because it's a big subject, but I think that's uh, briefly. We have it. When you started talking, you uh, briefly discussed the issue which you were you working with, or you were still working with. But I would like to uh, know that how do you understand your position set in that issue, and what do you think? How do you understand your, your position in that issue, or in any issue you're working with? You know, I uh, try to understand my uh, position uh, from the you know system that systems that I am in. You know, whether uh, you know, so uh, which uh, and uh, because there are so many, uh, comp you know, it's not so simple. You know, to just take up a position and say that you agree with this or you do not agree with this. So. Um, you know, what one has uh, uh, protested against right from the beginning, what makes sense to you, you know, which system you feel is the more, um, 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 actually every system has its own, um, you know, um, problems or its own, uh, you know, uh, um, um, plus points. But uh, my position, I can say that what makes sense to me, you know, in, uh, you know, for example, if I feel that in a system where capital and uh, labor congeal, you know, in the, um, you know, uh, endless um, uh, pursuit for profit, you know, that it doesn't work with me, you know, or if I feel that, um, you know, the man-made, uh, you know, uh, inequality, which is characteristic of domination and uh, exploitation, you know, without regard to the other, you know, present in the situation or in the, you know, that doesn't work with me. So I have to first understand what works with me or what doesn't work with me, and that's how I take position. Yeah. And then you, uh, like, being an artist, you also come up with an artwork, and if working in a project, like, to what extent the project is alive or, like, do you mean that uh, that the artwork has to be produced? No, I'm asking that does the project or the process of the project with the uh, production of an artwork, or does it like go No, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you know, uh, there's no. Uh, I mean, the outcome is all. This is this outcome is always there, even when you are interacting with people. There's some outcome. The outcome may be, you know, what uh, they have understood, uh, you know, and what I have understood. What, you know, they think is, uh, you know, uh, they have uh, sort of enjoyed or I have enjoyed or not enjoyed, you know. 
or where we have uh, you know uh, disturbed one another it's possible because you know any uh, collaboration uh, is not not uh, uh, free of uh, you know difficulties so and one doesn't go to interact with people with the idea that you are collaborating you see collaboration also is like um, it, it's not uh, that easy you know collaboration evolve i mean in my case i believe in that you know wherever uh, it has evolved you know from uh, my long term or short term interaction with people or uh, um, um, engagement you know where i have engaged myself if it if it, uh, it has evolved it's okay if it hasn't evolved it's all right also it's one still has gained or lost you know but one is not there to uh, you know get some benefits or lose or to lose it is uh, to understand if one has put oneself in that uh, you know on the grounds which are unfamiliar to you which i love doing you know and i always like this uh, aesthetic paradigms you know in which uh, to reinvent you know so what i know is not enough for me i, I always uh, i am interested in what i don't know so you know and it's so what i don't know to get into uh, those situations you know you uh, sort of you know try to uh, find out where you stand and what your position is and it's not necessary that there's an outcome you know in the form of an object or uh, whatever I mean the outcomes might well be uh, uh, more invisible or uh, yes yes you know silent yeah in the line of what what I was was talking about yes. in terms of the micro yes. yeah with the process you know the way the process is so important that it, the process it cannot be seen as an as an object as such yeah two two more questions um uh, you have already spoken you have already spoken about it but uh, i i was just going to ask you to explain uh, what do you mean by next slide problem because uh, for me the fight for jan jungle zameen is not a problem so is not a problem no hmm. i mean it is not a problem for, like for the fight for jan jungle zameen no, i don't think she is treating the nexlize as a problem ha huh, but she, she used just, the word so that's because it's just common parlance not taking a yeah. position that this thing is a problem yeah you know? but the language also flows right it is so i mean um using that as a problem word i mean i don't know i'm overly uh, connected to that but if we could just not use that maybe i mean i'm not preaching but it is a problem i mean resistance is a problem then why is it a problem this upon see i uh, like i said earlier you know that this uh, man made asymmetry you know which is created asymmetry you know which is uh, you know characteristic of domination exploitation so when you say that it is a problem when somebody else takes away that from you you know somebody doesn't even recognize that the other is there without regard to somebody else's existence you know so when that is the position somebody takes to dominate you know or to exploit whatever whether it is the people resources whatever you know affects the people who have existed there for centuries you know then there is resistance uh, just one more just one more question yeah uh, like my question is to whoever wants to answer like while we are discussing the very few options left for individuals to dissent against capitalism i just wanted to know that whether no matter what the person is doing whether art or studies or job whatever whatever it is i'm not getting into that whether choosing to do things slowly is can be one form of decent dissent like i'm saying like i'm i always keep thinking about this question so i just wanted to hear your thoughts like choosing to do things slowly and not expecting immediate results because capitalism is always like okay so you can do this faster and then you can get on to something else because that's that's what is always built into your brains and we are always pushed like get this done with and then you get on to better things so just trying to resist that mindset always is 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 it is it also a form of dissent possible form of dissent not i would i would like wholeheartedly agree i mean 
for, for me, I, slowness is, is also a very radical position has become to take. So I think it, uh, in, it uh, in, in fact, if, if one works, uh, you know, things a bit more, and, I mean, maybe not here, but, uh, uh, the, you know, the, if we think more about, you know, speed, uh, then it's not just, I mean, there, there are many things that are, you know, many things that are moving, you know. So in, in all the things that are moving, if we start looking at the question of speed, then immediately we're looking at the question of time because there's, you're looking at time and speed at the same time. So it could either be in, 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 in thinking, in moving, in looking. In, there are so many things that one is doing and speed is critical in it. So uh, I think it's, it's a key uh, to, the whole, to the whole politics of doubt. I mean, at the moment, even if we, we talk about the politics of doubt, uh, that itself is is, is uh, a pretty radical position, and, and even more so in the context of this morning's talk, you, it becomes quite explicit that uh, that itself is valuable. So, I would totally agree. Yeah. We need to I would just make it. I would try to make a practice out of it. I mean, I don't mean in a, like a lawyer's practice, but I mean, I mean, uh, how, how do you translate it rather than to just say I feel slow? You know, how, how do you translate it? In, in a real sense. We need to draw this to a close since it's 11 minutes past or into lunch time. Uh, could you just join me in thanking both Nacho and Amar for the contribution?